Yeah, Mike, I'm wondering, because you were at that uh, brick and mortar conversation that Richard organized, a panel with uh, Nicole Gladsburn, Jay Gorney. Jay Gorney and Josh Bear. Um, if you had any ideas about maybe what wasn't addressed in the talk that you felt should have been. Well, I, first of all, I think that the talk was incredibly timely. Uh, I think everyone in the gallery world, gallerists and people interested in kind of the evolution of, of uh, how we work, uh, you know, was interested in, in what, you know, some seasoned dealers had to say. Um, and I think the only thing that was missing was kind of a multi-generational take on this. I felt like the dealers involved had been in the business a long time. Um, and this was kind of a natural evolution to move out of that kind of traditional gallery mode into something that resembled something more private and uh, project-based uh, rather than um, being a traditional gallerist. So I think the next step is to hear from gallerists that are somewhere in the middle, uh, that have been in the business for a while, uh, but still have a long career in front of them. And then also the younger people coming, coming up and um, thinking about opening galleries or maybe just open a gallery or perhaps an artist that has opened up um, you know, an artist-run gallery space and to hear a little bit about their perspective. So I would say that was a great beginning because we, we heard a lot of experience up on the panel, which was great. But now I'd like to hear from different dealers that are at different stages of being a gallerist, either at the beginning or somewhere in the middle. And surprise, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> the next so step. So you're uh, basically in that middle range, I would assume. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've been working in galleries since 1989. So I, you know, definitely, you know, pre-internet and, and sending out slides and, and you know, photocopying. Um, but then, of course, moving into the digital age and then having a gallery myself now for the last 12 years, uh, you know, starting in Chelsea and then moving to the Lower East Side. Um, so now, yes, now I, I feel like I have still a long way to go uh, in my career, uh, but I also feel that things are changing. And you know, it's a good idea to kind of uh, you know, address that now and um, th figure out the possibilities. Yeah, that was one of the things in the panel that I felt like maybe should have been addressed more that wasn't, was that you said we're in the digital age now. So you started with photocopying, and it certainly goes beyond that, um, right. the differences. But uh, in your gallery, do you, uh, um, work like a brick and mortar space as well as the digital space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely have one, one, one foot in the old and one foot in the new. And, uh, you know, that new is a lot of different things. And, and it, for me, it's really turned out to be kind of a distribution system or an awareness system. How are people finding out about art? Uh, how are people viewing it? How are people buying it? What are the platforms that they're discovering? And you know, obviously the bricks and mortar space was, you know, I have a gallery, I have work on the wall, people come in, they see it, they experience it. And then of course the evolution of the website, so now people can experience it remotely. Uh, now there's the advent of the art fairs, which have been with us for quite some time, but that's yet another space where people can view art. And then uh, online marketplaces, uh, yet another place. So it's trying to understand all of these different ways that people are experiencing and buying art uh, and engaging with it and trying to figure out what's best and how much, how much of my resources need to go into each and which one is kind of you know, turning out to be the most successful. And if they, seems like right now they all simultaneously occur, um, but the question is five or 10 years in advance, wh what is gonna rise to the top? What is gonna be the way of working uh, for a gallery that has been used to the traditional model and how can that morph and and develop into something that maybe we haven't seen before and maybe that's a hybrid or maybe that's something completely new and that's what you were saying Sasha earlier was uh, that um, you got your sights set on where we're gonna be 10 years from now so you had a brick-and-mortar space but now would actually prefer not to even work in this mode yeah I mean I think that that there's a lot of different reasons for that but yeah I had a uh brick and mortar space for almost 10 years and um, let go of that space about three months ago. Oh, that's cool. So um, what I did is when a space became available on the second floor um, above my brick and mortar space, I took, I took it and um, knowing that I, I might do what I wound up doing, which is closing the ground floor space and just working out of the second floor space, um, which has worked so far, you know, very nicely for me, but it, it, it's, 
that, that's that's both. I mean, there's so many sort of um, branches there. There's the economics of it. There's my client's experience. There's my artist's experience, and there's my experience. I mean, right now, where I am in my life, I'm much happier not having a public space, which. Um, I, I don't want my day to be the same every day. I don't want, I mean, I, I've never really loved that. So for me, sort of to revert back to having more freedom and I've been traveling a lot more just the past few months, just, just all work trips to just go work with my artists in their studios, wherever they are. But that, that just feels fabulous to me on a personal level. I, I enjoy coming to work a lot more. Um, but it, it, it works out better for me economically as well. And something I wasn't sure was going to happen is that actually my clients really love it. Um, and I think it's just they, it's more private, you know? I mean, of course there are big galleries that have very private rooms where they work with their clients. I didn't have that. I had a back area, but it wasn't completely private. And there's something about um, the situation now where I, I was joking, I think, with Michael the other day about how, you know, now when I offer my clients something to drink, they always say yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So um, the bar is well stocked. There's something that's happening now that's actually working better for them as well. So I think the only thing that really needs to be figured out is how to satisfy my artist's desire for a public show. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my, I, you know the, the, the way I'm going to be working is I will have pop-up shows when there's a show, and, and, and I'm actually going to have one very soon, my first pop-up. Based on what I come up with, what my assumptions are, what do I need to build moving forward? And that actually is what I'm working on now. I'm working on a bigger plan to develop a new construct beyond what I'm doing right this second, um, that will make, you know, make sense for, um, you know, little ways down, down the road. So for me, I mean, the decision to get rid of my um, physical space was not easy. And as Michael knows, because, you know, we're old friends, we talk about these things a lot. Um, and I, I, I talked to a lot of people, um, because it was scary, because the, the paradigm, the, the structure of the physical gallery space is so unbelievably powerful. It's so intense. It's like that thing of the white box where you rotate shows every six, five, six, seven weeks is just, is, it's, it's so, you know, um, it's so deeply ingrained in the culture of the art world. And, you know, there were so many different things that went into the decision. One is that I started to um, not enjoy my experiences as much with people who are coming in. I've found that people under a certain age, um, instead of coming in and really engaging with the work and with me, asking questions, which I love, um, I found that people under a certain age start coming in and photographing the show and then leaving. And I, I, I assume that they'll interact with their peers when they post the photographs another time. And that's fine. I don't have any, I have no judgment about that whatsoever. It's just that experience became less interesting for me. So, you know, um, as someone who loves talking to strangers, that was a big loss for me. And it was very, it really became the norm. But I also just started to feel like um, my overhead was getting really, really crazy. And it was starting to feel really suffocating financially. And I guess the third thing for me is just I started to feel like my artist's always felt like they had to have a show every two years, that that became sort of the industry norm. And I felt like a lot of projects were being aborted before they were finished. And then my artists wanted to have shows of new work before it was ready. And so we were losing on both ends. Bodies of work were not complete and on either, you know, on either side. And 
no matter how many times you know, I tried telling different artists of mine to relax and that this was just a false paradigm, it was arbitrary, and because it's the way the industry works, they, they really couldn't get away from it. And it started to feel not good to me. It started to feel like I was putting up too many shows that were sort of not fully baked. And, um, you know, if you don't feel when, when you hang a show, if you don't feel like just, you want to feel filled with pride and, and, you know, just, there's a feeling you get when you know you've put up a great show that is so amazing. And I started to just feel like there were too many shows going up that were good and not great. Um, and I just wanted to get off that sort of hamster wheel. And so that was, that was my decision. And there's a lot of other reasons, but th those are sort of the big ones. Um, and, I, and I feel free. And, I, and I, I feel I'm working on all these other projects and it is, you know, all these other sort of things have come my way. I'm much more productive. I'm selling more. I'm more focused. It, it's, it's, for me, it's worked out really, it's worked out nicely. And I still have all my same artists. So I still represent my artists. I still have all my clients. And things continue, you know, just without the sort of um, feeling of, ha of having to conform to a certain standard. So Sasha, you said there a minute ago that um, you found yourself spending more time in your artist's studio. So is that a directly uh, result of having lost the, the gallery space itself? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have always gone to my artist studios to work for a couple reasons. One, I think it's ridiculous to, I mean, if an artist says to me, I have, you know, a box of 20 prints I want to show you, that that's easy if they want to come in, whatever. But mostly I feel like, you know, you have to go to the studio to, to really see what's going on. And um, so I've always traveled to my artist's studios. It's just that, you know, I had to be careful about how I spaced my trips, you know, because I didn't want to be away from the gallery for too long. And there was also always a, a feeling of anxiety about being away. And now I'm just like, <laughs> no, no anxiety. And yeah. You know, I, I can even spend that extra day. I mean, I used to do these crazy trips where I would, like, I have an artist in Maine, and, you know, I'd fly in, I'd get in, like, at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, we'd work for, like, 36 hours straight, barely sleep, and then I'd come back. You know, and now I can just sort of take a little bit um, more time. You know, I really enjoy that process, and, and being able to just, you know, sit there with my artists in their studio and, you know, in California with one of my artists, I was just sitting in the studio for three days. I stayed with him. So it's like we were like together all the time, just looking at work, talking about work, you know, drinking coffee, looking at work, drinking beer, looking at work, you know, like it was the whole day. So it was, you know, so, so productive. And I just really love being, you know, I really love that freedom. I mean, I, for me, temperamentally and for sort of where I want to go with my business and the way I show work and deal with artists, this works for me because I really like being able to, you know, I just think of all of it as, you know, it's just like, this is so cliche, but you know, the river is flowing and I just want to be flowing with the river, you know, and for me, having a gallery started to feel like I was walking the wrong way. Um. So Mike, you, you joyfully maintain your brick and mortar space, <laughs> despite the fact that uh, you were saying a lot of these, um, I guess, retired or retiring um, um, dealers that we were seeing at the brick and mortar panel who are in a later stage in their career mm -hmm. seem to be disavowing their need for such a space. Mm -hmm. But you feel as if um, in, a, in the mid-career here, you like working both angles. And um, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. I mean, I, I think part of it is the nature of my personality. Uh, you know, I'm very social. Uh, I like people coming in. I like engaging with them. Uh, I don't mind if they have a lot of questions. I don't know if they, if, I don't care if they don't know the artist. I'd like to inform them of that. And, and I like having a home, if you will. And I like people coming into that home and I like hosting that. So I made the move uh, from Chelsea uh, to Lower East Side 
And I first started on Allen Street, which is just a block away from Orchard where I am now. But I found I would mount shows and I would always take a tab over how many people would come in. And tops, I would get 16 people in. And I thought, I, I, I can no longer mount an exhibition from an artist who has spent some years creating a body of work for only a handful of people to see it, let alone actually selling it, which was a challenge. So I decided to move myself, if I was gonna move, I was gonna move myself front and center, which was Orchard Street at the time, and where I still am. And the amount of foot traffic there is really rich for me. And I have found that I've con you know, made you know, converts of people just happen to walk by the space and come in and buy work. So my mentality is this, if I'm able to justify a gallery that I have now as a bricks and mortar, based on the amount of foot traffic that I get of people that normally would not know about me or find me, then I think it's a wash, then I think it's equal. It's gonna come a point where being front and center on Orchard and nobody coming in and buying work, just you know, foot traffic wise, then I'm really gonna to have to think, you know, this does not work anymore for me. I don't need it. But the way I'm set up now, I have some really big storefront windows. I put some, I put some art in there that I think really draws people in. And, and I engage with them. And I still think that the gallery provides a platform for physical interaction between two people. One is the art seller, the other is the art buyer, that really does communicate and transform uh, for the possibility of a sale. And if I don't have that, I just think I'm missing a big tool in the toolbox. Um, but at the end of the day, it's gonna to come to economics. If it comes to a point where my rent is so high that I don't care how many walk-ins I get, it doesn't pay, then I'll, then I'll exit. So part of it is based right, is hinges on the, the economics of maintaining a space like that and having its benefit, and that is for me, um, having walk-in traffic. Um, and in addition to that, I, I do feel that it's an important step for an artist's completion of that body of work to actually show it in a public space. Um, it allows for kind of a celebration uh, on their part. Um, and it also, it also allows for critical evaluation. And that's the one thing that I don't think will occur if an exhibition isn't in place, whether that's uh, online, New York Times, New Yorker is that if it's not an exhibition, it's not gonna get reviewed and it's not gonna have a critical dialogue. And I do think that the gallery, the bricks and mortar space allows for that. I mean, I don't know many online shows that are reviewed critically. Now, maybe they're spoken about, but it just doesn't provide kind of the same temperament that uh, a gallery exhibition you know, will do. So, you know, as long as the economics work and they're, they still are working for me, um, I like the space, and I think there are a lot of benefits from that. Yeah, so from my point of view as an artist who sort of fell into this gallery dealing issue, which is um, an extension, I consider it an extension of the work that I was doing or I am doing, um, for me the question became very quickly, not so much brick and mortar, but the, the tradition of the white cube itself and the way that uh, it whitewashes basically its, its history for each show, so you have a kind of reset. Um, so uh, my gallery being down the hall from my studio, it quickly became kind of a sculptural object where we didn't return to the, the white cube. So it became, uh, so each show sequentially built on its, the prior show. And there were some aesthetics left from that, that history in the space. So the work, new work had to, uh, and, and luckily it never really detracted from, uh, and we didn't let it get to a point where it detracted from the given artist show that was was in the space, um, but um, that wasn't necessarily something that I felt like is a solution um, for the brick and mortar idea or the white cube. Generally speaking, it just was something that uh, grew out of my own artistic needs and my own relationship to the artists that I was working with to create what I felt like was an experimental, experiential, dynamic space uh, that could be. And this wasn't strategic, but it became that. The space itself was um, an experience that one couldn't get online, for example, or even if you bought like the distinct objects. And my goal became to create an environment where the artist's work 
would be better than they even expected it to be. That um, in our collaboration, it would push them to do things that maybe they didn't feel like they could in more traditional sort of environments. Um, and um, like in, in talking to people about this um, idea of not only artists uh, and well, artist dealer relationships, like what it is that you do together when you put up a show, like who's in control, who's, who's making the aesthetic decisions, who's the curator is, um, those, those became very quickly problematic because I was an artist too and um, had my own ideas, as everyone does, about how something should be installed or shown. Um, so, th yeah, the nature of some of those shows at Cat House Funeral ended up being maybe collaborative in ways that uh, a, a normal one-person show wouldn't necessarily be. Uh, and the solution there was that the artist would, uh, you know, generally have to show other places if they wanted a different kind of experience. So I don't represent artists in the way that it gallery normally does in a kind of contractual way and where they have an, I have some sort of exclusive relationship with them. So fortunately I ended up with two spaces to work with. One is a conventional white cube space that came after having uh, done this kind of program that I'm describing in Cat House Funeral which uh, was um, this additive space that wasn't uh, a traditional white cube. Um, but then that uh, space is now um, being deconstructed and reconstructed in off-site locations. I don't, I, you know, I know this pop-up term is popular, but it seems diminutive to me. I don't, I prefer the Smithson notion of a site, non-site sort of experiences or um, choosing a space that, that fits with the work that needs to be shown. Um, and it, 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 its temporality is less important than the fact that it, it can be a, a, a unique and unusual experience. And as a curator or as an artist or as someone, um, it, it pushes one to, make certain kinds of uh, thematic and aesthetic decisions differently in, in different kinds of environments. It, uh, you know, one of the things that maybe becomes sort of um, uh, monotonous is having to always show in the same space. You know, you get used to what looks good on what wall, and, um, uh, but in different spaces then. So, uh, you know, maybe you're talking about um, future ideas, future plans, uh, some kind of system which seems impossible to implement where one rotates and uses different kinds of spaces um, rather than having to put down a lease, which in New York City, uh, long-term leases are more and more rare. So maybe that is, we just have to remain more light on our feet, possibly, mm -hmm. you know. It's interesting because even as, as recently as like six months ago, I read an interview with someone who just closed completely. And they were saying that the main reason was because of art fairs. But I actually think that a lot of people are probably having trouble because of online marketplaces and they, they may not even really realize it. So I think actually online and the ability to buy art online um, has had a massive effect on the industry. And in ways people don't, we're sort of, it's sort of the frog in the water where we're solely being boiled. Like, you know, I, I think that it's sort of crept up. Um, but, I mean, you know, my whole goal is to, I mean, I try really, really hard, and I know Michael's like this, I try really hard to not be upset. Like, the world, things change, right? Who cares? Like, the, the point is just to try and figure out a way to change with it and, and you know, and be happy with those changes. And I, I can honestly say that, I, you know, I'm fine with where we are now. I, I mean primarily because I have a will, I have free will. So, um, you know, I don't love all the online marketplaces that have popped up and, and some of them are sort of strange to me and I don't love all the art fairs, but so I don't do them. You know, it's like no one has a gun to my head. So, um, but, you know, I, I do think objectively speaking where we are right now compared to 10 years ago um, you know, there are galleries 10 years ago, there were art fairs and their big galleries would do one or two a year and there were no online marketplaces. Now those galleries are doing about, you know, between 15 and 20 art fairs a year. They're just constantly sending out different staff members and, and they're on two or three online marketplaces. So there's no question that it's a totally different experience. Um, but... 
you know, my thing is just really just comes down to um, figuring out, you know, okay, there's still got to be little pieces here and there that serve our clients best that haven't been addressed yet. And what are those and how do I do them? I mean, you know, so that's sort of where my thinking is. Um, and, and I agree with you. I, I think, you know, there has been a lot of changes in the things that galleries have embraced over the years as additional tools may ultimately be our undoing. Um, and it, it was a time, you know, when I opened it 12 years ago, uh, the on, not the only way, but one of the only ways that one could really engage with the art and the art world and see what was new was to go to the gallery. That's right. That was yeah. the wellspring. That was, that was where it all happened. There was an event, new work. I've never seen this before. Fresher than a museum could turn because the gallery could do a show uh, you know, in, a, in a hot minute if it wanted to do it. Um, and also, the other thing was the artwork was held back. In other words, the first time you got a chance to see it all was in the gallery. Not you know through Instagram, not through Facebook, not right. through this post and that post. So it's kind of like uh, when I think of music and the way music w used to be released. Yeah. You waited until that record came out, yeah. and you got you got the whole thing. Yeah. Now you got a single here, a single, a special right. EP, you know this right. and that. So the distribution model has been has been different. Absolutely. And I think galleries have readily embraced technological and non-technological advances, whether that's the art fair, whether that's having a website, uh, whether that's having the online marketplaces, doing pop-up shows to expand your presence. You have a gallery here, but you do a pop-up in San Francisco. So it's not to replace it, it's actually to add to it. Right. So the, the ways that we can present work and engage our audience has greatly increased. Yes. But with that has been a certain sense of loss of control um, and additionally, the other change that I see is um, how artists are in the picture. I think before that artists were viewable via the gallery. Right. Now artists have the direct connection. That's right. It's kind of like my manufacturer, instead of, uh, instead of me then selling it in my retail store, you can buy direct from the manufacturer. That's right. And they're showing their goods. So it's like now yeah. we're just, our power, if you will, has shrunk. Absolutely. And, 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 <laughs> and this our, is, maybe our importance. That's right. And I, when I was talking earlier about where are we going to be in 10 years, I mean, I actually believe that artists are going to be dealing directly with clients way more as the years go on. And mm -hmm. I, I think there'll be a platform, a really good platform created a digital for platform artists. to connect artists and as far as clients. commerce goes strictly commerce why shouldn't they i agree that's why i'm not <laughs> upset about it i, but think, I think that question inevitable. has been around for a while uh, I, uh, there's that uh, famous documentary i was referencing earlier painter's painting um where one of the artists in a panel there there's someone's like richard is videotaping this panel conversation and the guy the artist says when are we going to have direct access to why do we have to go through these museums when can we can uh -huh. when can we as artists directly access the Rockefellers, for instance, for right. collecting. Well, well, now they have. Now they have. Because Rockefellers have, right. you know, are on their Instagram, or that, following them on Instagram. Right. So it's like, yes, the, the access is there. Yeah. I, I would argue that if it makes sense, it should be, right? Yeah. So, you know, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's bike lanes taking over New York City, um, or whether it's gay marriage, or whether it's mm -hmm. artists dealing directly right. with clients. You know, I'm serious. Like oh, these yeah. things are, this is evolution, and it's evolution right. that makes sense. It is yeah. inevitable. Mm -hmm. And so there's no point in getting upset about things that make sense and are inevitable. Yeah. What's well, upsetting if the art is, the art itself is degraded somehow. So, suffer, to me, if the, the, the process of making the art and such yeah. as suffers, Possibly, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I would think the experience of the work right. only... I don't think it will, because there will always be museums. See, I think right. that yeah. there will always be certain institutions oh, yeah. that where there's real, you know, Physical talk about engagement. gatekeepers, where there mm -hmm. really is, like, rigor. But, you know, but I think that's why we have to get a lot more creative about exactly. what our role is. Yeah, and because... what, and what, and what now? What can we offer? We're, you know, right. we're, we're before we offered the white walls, we offered some guidance, we offered some sales. Right. But now a lot of that is elsewhere. But I, I, I think also the 
what I see a parallel is, is to publishing. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, the writer right. or the artist very similar. And before it was the big publishers. You had to go to one of the big publishers to do right. it. They would just be distributed in a certain way and they could only be distributed at bookstores where you had to go. Right. So there was a lot of there was a lot of power in few places. Right. And now it's different. But I also feel that the one thing that the writer still needs as the artist needs and that is a good editor. That's right. There, there's, and I think if you read any any novel or any any book of essays, you always see a big thank you, and the big thank you usually goes out to the editor, right? The person that went through the process with the writer, that's and I right. feel that the gallerist still plays that role, and that's probably our most important role that we I can agree. hold on to and maintain, as long as artists still feel that they need it. Because I think some artists now like, hey, you know, I'm just going to do this all myself. Right. So, that, so, so, yeah. good. You know, good luck. Go ahead. I mean, but, but, you know, what we've been talking about, what I've mentioned a number of times, and what you've asked me about is about going to my artist studios. So, there's no quite. People ask me all the time, how, how, why are my artists still with me when I don't have a physical, permanent space? And it's because, they know. That, I mean. Just imagine that, you know, you're an artist, you're, you're making art, which we all know is a very, can be a very lonely experience, but there's a certain unbelievable self-involvement that comes with making art. It, it's just, that's just the way it is. You're in your head, you're, you're, you have to have this, a certain drive and a certain dedication, a single-mindedness, and there's someone there who is willing to talk to you about those things whenever you want. Mm -hmm about you. Whenever I go to my artist studios, we are talking about them. What are right. you thinking? What do you want to do? Where are you going? What does this mean? What does that mean? If you're willing, and in my case, I think what works well with my artists is I'm not just willing to do that and be that person for them. I love it. I love those. I love debating the merit of every single piece. I mean, I, I, you know, I just, I just love that experience. So I think that is where if, if you don't move towards that place, I think you do become obsolete. Yeah. And you, you have, you, you cannot be, um, expendable. I mean, you, you have That's to right. be needed. And I think that we are at an advantage, these so-called, I would say, uh, mid-career galleries, um, that have had artists and they get that. Well, I, I, I wonder how you, Michael, feel about art school because you, <laughs> you teach. Um, I, I do. I do the occasional guest lecture where I mm -hmm. go in and I'm a total bummer, mm -hmm. but you actually. Um, I, you know, I think, uh, I think the most important thing is that someone entering into art school, whether it's undergrad or graduate, has a clear understanding of expectations, of uh, evaluation of who they are as an artist, the, the, their skill level, their intention, um, and what they can expect when they graduate. I think... Well, whose responsibility is that, though? Because it can't really be the responsibility of some 18-year-old knucklehead with an undeveloped no, brain. No, to think about themselves. But, but the, the challenge is, and we were talking about, is that, you know, maybe some students like, I like photography. I think I'm, you know, let me study photography. And they really don't know what that means yeah. and, uh, and what that means at the, at the end of four years for them uh, versus their investment of their time and, and their money or their parents' money to do it. So I just think there needs to be a better education uh, uh, to let, and I don't know who, who, is that, who is that person or who is that body, but to get a clear understanding of really what to expect if you're really right for art school um, and, and then figure it out. Because I think it's... I think it's a great benefit for many people that that are committed to it, that are dedicated to it, and have their expectations in check versus how much they're going to invest and how much time they're going to invest and what the payoff is and what it's going to be like post-graduation. And I think that a lot of times the art schools um, don't even, at an undergrad or even at a graduate level, don't really inform their students of what to expect after they get out. Like, what do they need to understand about the art world? What they need to understand about making a living and being an artist? And are those that things mutually exclusive? so important. I, I, right. I don't know how that, that, I don't know how you can graduate kids who have no sense of that. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. in the performing arts, you know, I know at the schools that have 
particularly conservatory programs, SUNY Purchase, which has conservatory programs in the Performing Arts Juilliard, you know, those, those students know. I mean, they, they know how hard it's going to be. Right. There's been right. no pussyfooting around. I mean, you know, when you're dealing with ballerinas and opera singers, like, they really know the deal. I'm not yeah. sure why those those same conversations don't happen with... Well, I think in part, uh, I think part of it is like uh, when you mentioned those conservatory schools, that sounds like a very dedicated, intense course of study that is probably highly competitive. That yes. would be my guess. Uh, I feel at a certain level, the undergraduate, maybe the programs are not that competitive. Maybe it's actually easier to get into something like that, which would might allow a student with slightly less talent or even less ambition to enter into the program. Yep. Um, so that could possibly be a part of it. Uh, you know, if a school has a certain quota or has to f you know, fill a certain amount of students in their student body, they may lower their standard and they may not give full disclosure of what people are actually getting involved with. And then you get a good group of people in there that actually somewhere along the line realizing, I don't think I want to be a photographer. I don't yep. want to be an artist. This yep. is too hard. My right. interest isn't strong enough. Where I feel at a conservatory level or a more competitive MFA program, you're going to kind of weed out the people that are either yeah, A, absolutely. less talented, or B, just don't have what it takes. And what I mean by that is the staying power yeah. to stay with it for four years and then make a living out of it, at least in part. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for me, the bottom line is art school under the right conditions is, is a good experience for the right candidate. But probably most of the people that are in there perhaps it's not a good fit. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I, I, I always, I, I, I know that, you know, this doesn't really bear out, but I almost wish that um, you could come up for evaluation. I mean, the thing is that, you know, they don't really do that if you're a lit major or a chem major. I mean, obviously you have to maintain a certain grade point average, but I do think like, you know, I think too many artists are just, you know, uh, graduating without enough skill and without any sense of what it takes. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know my, my, my uh, one of my best friends, I went to purchase and one of my best friends was a dancer and she was asked to leave because they didn't think she was serious enough. I mean, right. and... Right. And when I say she was asked to leave, she, <laughs> she was told to leave. It was it not was a conversation. Yeah. And now, for better or worse, they used to post wait notices for the ballerinas. Like you, In those days, and I, I'm old, this was a long time ago, but you could not be a fat ballerina, you know, mm -hmm. like, because they knew you were not going to get hired. And so there was a certain, and look, these things, this is a debate that's obviously filled with a lot of different tentacles and you know, it's hard to sort of sum up, but I do think that there are too many kids who are getting out with these like huge student uh, loans, these right. debts, and they're not, they have no idea what it takes. They don't have any ability at all. And I, I find that really heartbreaking. But, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, if I could sort of grab a hold of graduating artists, I would, um, I would tell them not to get caught up in the, these, these sort of um, paradigms that we've created, that we've been talking about, that really have nothing to do with, um, you know, they're not organic. They, they are, they, they're, they're constructs. And there is no timetable. I mean, if it takes you 10 years to produce one masterpiece, then that's, that's the way you work. You know, I mean, we could sit here and go down the list of, you know, some of the greatest artists of all time who produced, you know, very few pieces. And then there are some who, you know, produce tons of work and um, there is no right or wrong. And you know, yet I think that the constructs of the art world, or as I call it now, the art industrial complex, you know, make these kids feel like they have to have a show, they have to be in a gallery right away. That's going to somehow change their life, which it's not. Mm -hmm. And then they have to have a show every two years, whether they're ready or not. And I just, it would just be, people need to figure out how to develop a practice that's going to nurture them throughout their entire life. And 
that's a very personal and private thing. And I feel like the art world has intruded really there and sort mm -hmm. of just, you know, eaten young people alive. And, and I think social media plays into this too. And the I need think so to too. be famous and, you know, it's just making art and fame need to disengage. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just to kind of add on to that, I, I think it's a long game. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we are, whether it's adults or, or young people, are so used to wanting some instant gratification of something yeah. to happen right away. I don't have patience for it. I want it now because I usually get it now. And it, it's like, it, it, it is like bacon cookies. Like you can't take them out of the oven too soon, even yeah. though you're hungry. Right. And you just have to let that develop. And people develop differently. Some people are very prolific. Some people are slower. Some people start with one medium and then they give that up because their right. true medium is something else. Absolutely. And you can't know that by rushing it. Right. You have to give yourself time under the correct guidance no matter how many years it takes. And the other thing I would say you know, beyond that is that as an artist or a gallerist is that you have to diversify your, your revenue streams or how you make a living. Yes. Um, yeah. And that you know, the days of being a gallerist where you kind of sit in there and you put stuff on the wall and that's how you make your living by selling that stuff is probably really not you know, going to be happening right now. And, you know, this is true for artists too. It's just go in your studio, make work and sell it. Right. You, there's, you're going to have to add a lot more things to that. Right. You teach, for instance, and yeah. I do a lot of consulting with people who I don't represent. Right. Yeah. And that adds to, it, it takes the pressure off and it adds a very practical, you know, form of resources and, and income, yep. you know, for me. Yep. And it makes me a, be a better, I think you're just yeah, a better you person enjoy all around it. Yeah. I enjoy it. I'm yeah, not doing something I don't want to right. do. Right. No, it's continuing to do things. But it takes the pressure off and that informs what I do as a gallerist right. as well, you know, yep. no doubt. But I would say that's going to be true for, you know, being a gallery or being an artist. And the other thing I would say is don't, as a gallerist, don't feel you have to do everything that everyone else is doing. Right. You know, when I first did it, I felt like I had to frame all my artist shows and I right. had to do all these art fairs. And before you know it, I was spending so much more money than really my gallery was generating. Right. So you really have to understand that you're st you may have to start small. You do little by little. Yep. You may want a bigger space. You may want a fancier That's website. That's one of the biggest traps, You know, right? all the thing. And you yeah. may want to do the fancy art fair. Keeping but, up with the Joneses. But yeah. just because you think you can or you have the credit to do it, yeah. isn't, it's not necessarily a right. good move. Yeah, no. Okay. You have to grow as, um, as naturally as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, you know, I, th I think that, you know, both of us combined have had a lot of years of experience and have seen kind of the old way of doing it, the yeah. new way of doing it, and a way that we haven't even discovered yeah. uh, yet. And I just, I think that gallerists, whether they have that bricks and mortar space or they don't, have to be nimble yeah, and absolutely. have to be able to pivot yeah. and have to be open to letting old ways go and embracing new ones, even though they're not the absolutely. most comfortable, or even if it's embracing a technology that they don't feel like they understand yet. Yeah. Which may be a metaphor for getting older in general. <laughs> you know, don't walk around saying those young people. You have to just figure you out. Have you, you have to keep. You have to keep, keep up moving. with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and the other thing is, you know, as a gallerist, is to you know, we have a whole, hopefully, a whole new generation of collectors right. that have been raised differently, and think about absolutely. the world differently, absolutely. And we can't dish them out That's the right. way that no, no, we no. think they That's should, right. you know, see art. And if, absolutely. If they think, you know, actually, I just follow Instagram feeds. And that's how I buy my art from the artists that I follow. I'm like, all right then. Fine. You know? Right. No, I agree. <laughs> that's not the wrong way to do it. That's, I agree. That's Whatever the way you do it. Whatever makes someone happy is the right way for them, frankly. Right. And, you know, I, right. I, I totally agree. Just we have, we have to be adaptable and changeable. Yep. And I think that's the bottom line. Agreed. Yeah. I think the generation ahead of us got into it for a lot of the same reasons we've gotten into it. And yeah. that is because we love it. We yeah. love the art. No, everyone we, gets into it, loves. Yeah. Loves. No one, I don't think, I think very few people would say, you know, I'm getting into it because I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, it's a real money maker. Yeah, and uh, I don't think that's it. I think they have a genuine knowledge yeah. and love, uh, you know, for the art and the artist process Absolutely. and the creative process. Absolutely. Uh, I, think the, I think the biggest difference is when they were doing it, you know, there was kind of one way of doing it. Right. And, and they, many of them did it that way. Now I think when you enter, uh, there are many ways yep. to do it and many ways to engage with it. And there's not one right way I, absolutely anymore. And I don't think that. there's an end goal either. Like I don't, right. I don't know what my right. best case scenario is. Right.
Yeah. I don't. I don't know anymore. Maybe we'll be selling art from like a uh, instead of having a food truck, of an art truck. No, I think people. Right. Did, yeah, you buy like a U-Haul yeah. and you just park it, open up the pop, gate, and just yeah, pop up shows. Come on, on wheels. come on in. I mean, yeah. I think there's a. And I think, I think that's already being done. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> I think anything goes. Yeah. I and agree. I don't think people are going to blink an eye. You share yeah. a gallery. We shared a gallery. Yep. No, no big deal. You right. have a pop-up show. No, no big, big deal. deal. You yeah. know, you okay. represent artists, but you don't have a permanent space. No big deal. I agree. Deal. I mean, I said to people when I was doing this transition that I was going to, you know, pop-up shows when I had, you know, a show that I really wanted to, was, was crying out to be seen. And I, I, I said, and I firmly believe this, that that will be the, uh, very normal. Right mm-hmm. now, it's not as much the norm, but I think in a year, it's going to be like... But even in, even in New know. York, there are spa- there's always been event spaces, but right. there are dedicated spaces for exhibitions, for that's retail right. pop-up, right. which could easily be Absolutely. gallery exhibitions. So right. there, that's what they right. do. That's right. what their business right. model is, is to right. take people like us, to take fashion brands that are right. just starting... And do a pop up, whether it's one day, twenty four hours, right. or a week or a month. Right. So they understand there's a need for that. Right. Absolutely. And and you know we're happy to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Agreed. 